Hey, I'm uh, Vaughan Davis from the Goat Farm. Um, on Facebook, I'm who I used to be, uh, which is the same of all of us. My photo is a little bit older than many of ours. On LinkedIn, I'm all professional because my button, uh, my shirt has buttons. And on uh, on Twitter, I'm a bit of both. I'm an aeroplane flying, advertising owning uh, goat farmer. Thanks for having me. Uh, I'm also a social media expert, and I am because I printed out a certificate and declared myself to be one. And that's kind of a serious point because there's no such thing. And I, I do understand the irony of, uh, of being here at your invitation to, uh, to share my social media expertise. But as I'll get onto in a minute, it's not one of those things that you really want to waste time going to university to learn. It's something that uh, you master by doing. Um, the topic of my talk today is, holy shit, here comes the internet. And I was talking to my 16 and 13 year old sons about this and the way that the internet and social media and sports are combining. They're really big sports fans. All winter long they play soccer, but all year round they watch sport, they consume it on the internet. They watch it all weekend, they talk about it with their friends online while they're watching it, and then on Monday morning at school, they talk about it. This is the sport that they watch. It's audio only at the moment. Hands up once you recognize the sport. This is huge. Okay, we'll go to video. And we'll just move through to gameplay. And drop the audio, please. Do we know what this is yet? No one? If you're a 13 or 16 year old kid, this is the, uh, the chief competitor to the sports that you guys organize and try and televise and promote. This is League of Legends. Um, and this was video footage from the World Championships, which was late, late last year. Millions of kids watch this online every day, all around the world. I thought they were just sitting there playing it, but they're actually watching other people play it. The World Championships are huge. It was held live, live, eight people on a stage in the middle of the stadium that was used for the Football World Cup. In, uh, in Korea, live. 45,000 people bought tickets to watch people play a video game. We're laughing at our own future. Uh, 40 international broadcast partners, 27 million, I know it's not the biggest thing in the world, but 27 million is not to be sneezed at, and the winning, pr uh, the winning team, four people, won $2.1 million US. So the internet is coming, holy shit. The internet is coming for the health and fitness industry. Um, Weight Watchers. Their share price tanked in the last two years. And a couple of nods in the audience, you know the story. It tanked because of this, because of the Fitbit. Five years ago, these things were coming, and Weight Watchers went, oh, well, yeah, we've, got, you know, we've got a successful business, have had for 40 years, we're doing really well, it's not a threat. They did some appy stuff, and they did some online stuff, but it didn't do enough. So this took the place, in a lot of people's lives, of Weight Watchers. It's also taking the place of gyms. You know, why pay $2,000 for a gym membership that you're not going to go to when you could pay $200 for a fitness tracker that's going to track walks that you're not going to take? So that's, that's, that's cheaper. <laughs> all, the, all my serious points, I'm totally serious. Um, coaches are under attack from the internet, from technology, from social media. My watch will tell me when it's time for go for a run. My watch will tell me when I've had a great run. My friends online will back that up. Events are under attack from the internet. There was a study in uh, New York earlier this year, 1,500 social media users. 75% of them said they had compromised a real world activity in order to record and share it for social media. Okay, so it's more important to make a film about your life than it is to live your life for more and more and more people. So you'll stop in the middle of the Auckland Marathon to take a photo of yourself doing the Auckland Marathon, thereby compromising your time in the Auckland Marathon. But it's more important to share it with your friends. And this is happening all over the place. Even motorsports are under attack from the internet. 
V8 Supercars has gone to great lengths to engage fans over the years. But this year's super cheap Auto Bathurst 1000 is set to take that to a new level and have an actual influence on the racing. Via social media, supporters will be able to boost their favourite driver by a maximum of 41 horsepower for half a minute over the course of the day. Pro Drive Racing Australia has won the great race over the past two years and has also claimed a very close second placing in 2012 with David Reynolds. Yeah, I wish I had this in 2012 on the last lap because I'd probably be sitting here champion. But, you know, last year, um, you know, the bloke who started last did the Stephen Bradbury and won the race, so it's possible again with this sort of system in, in play. As well as the fan boost, there will also be a fan reduce, with followers able to take away power from drivers. Cars are set to carry green flashing lights to show who is using the boost. Um, did you guys see this in the news exactly 14 days ago? Yeah, it was bullshit. But, you know what? Um, who believes that this won't ever happen? I can see this happening. I can see something like this happening where the digital world and the real world converge. So the internet is coming, holy shit, and sports is not immune. Um, I'm going to talk about social media. I, I like images, so I wanted, to, um, I wanted to illustrate the idea of what exactly is social media, and I put WTF into Google Image Search, and I came up with this. Does anyone recognize it? It's an it's a exhibition of sculpture from Christchurch about five years ago from an artist called Ron Muick. It's pretty cool. So what is social media? Lots of different definitions, uh, but mine is really simple. It's where brands are equal to people. And 10 years ago, my background, um, I was lucky enough to do some work with Raylene back in the day. Uh, my background is in traditional advertising where the brand, the team, the code, the athlete, whatever, stands up on, a, on a, a platform and broadcasts to the people. Social media has changed that round and it's a much more equal place. Uh, what social media is not is a channel. It's not a megaphone. It's not a way for you to amplify your messages or make your athletes more famous or make people love your team. It's the reverse of that. It's a magnifying glass and the magnifying glass is being held not by you guys but by the public. And they magnify what they choose to magnify. You can do anything you like to be cool and to be viral or to you know, make, a, uh, make a great video with that, uh, that musician, uh, but if the public chooses not to put their magnifying glass on it, nothing's gonna happen. So there's a real equality and there's a real lack of control for brand owners, which is scary exciting at the same time. What social media also is, this one looks a bit like the Prime Minister, I think. <laughs> I've only, I just realized that this morning. I don't think it is him. I'm pretty sure it's not him. Um, it's a great way to listen. So put away the, the idea of it being a megaphone and pick up the idea of it being a way to listen. I mean, a lot of us do uh, research. So we'll do you know, quarterly research or monthly research if we can afford it. Uh, a, a really engaged social media community is a fantastic way to hear all the time, in real time, what the fans are thinking. A little bit of a caveat with that is the people on social media are not necessarily exactly the same as all your fans, so you sort of need to become uh, sensitive to the differences there. You know, Twitter especially, and we, we social media people gravitate towards Twitter. Who's, who uses Twitter in the room? Heaps! Excellent. Um, you know, but there's only maybe 200,000 of us uh, in New Zealand, as opposed to, you know, 2.5 million on uh, Facebook, 3.5 million on Trade Me. Uh, Guy Williams, you know, the TV comedian fella, he said, uh, you know, Twitter is pretty much grey living with a smartphone. And it kind of is sometimes. So you don't want to get those attitudes too mixed up. So that's what social media is for me. Uh, why would we do it? Uh, because, you know, social's already doing us. We know this. You know, people have always been having conversations about our brands. They just, they just do. They talk about us, they talk about our teams, our athletes, our codes. What social media gives us is the opportunity to be part of those conversations, which is, which is fantastic. It's new, and you know, Raylene's um, you know, blog with the boss thing is a fantastic example of, here comes the biggest word in the whole presentation, disintermediation. So cutting out those bastards in the press uh, and going straight to the fans, which is kind of cool. Why else would you do it? Um, because people don't trust us. People don't trust us as brands and as marketers and as advertisers. So AC Nielsen does a, um, a research study every year and the answers are always about the same. And they ask New Zealanders, 
who do you trust, who do you consult when making a major purchase decision? You know, house, car, which team to back, I don't know. And brands, that's us, you know, the people who run the advertising, uh, only get uh, a tick sort of 32% uh, of the time. Experts, so the reviewers, the, um, you know, the opinion leaders, if you like, do a little better, but friends knock it out of the park at 79%. This has always been the way, but now with social media, you get to be that friend, which is a great opportunity. Why else to do it? Because it's a really good use of your time as a brand owner or a marketer or a team owner or whatever it is, or, or, or an athlete. Uh, you could spend five minutes on the phone to someone, you could spend five minutes writing an email to someone, or you could spend five minutes writing a Facebook post and go to 100,000 people. So the ROI on social media in terms of your time is really high. Using social media reflects where people are in terms of their media use. So this is a, a graph out of TNS research, uh, 2011, so it might have shifted a little bit in favour of digital. But uh, time spent in the week by New Zealanders. So TV, around 29%, online leisure, 29%, online work, in inverted commas, 14%. So the digital, you know, um, four years ago was already outpacing the TV. You know, radio in the purple, newspapers in the seven, and magazines down there in the red. Uh, what it doesn't show is quality, of course. If you're reading a magazine, you're probably a bit more immersed in it than you are if, you know, the TV's on the corner or you listen to the radio. The other thing this doesn't really address, and this is, this is really exciting, is the whole idea of multi-screening. So if you're watching TV these days as a sports fan, you're hardly ever just watching the TV. You're doing other stuff at once. Um, is anyone from Cricket NZ here? Point. <laughs> Um, this, is a, this is very blurry, I'm sorry, but this is, um, this is the Twitter screen at, uh, at the Black Caps during the, the semi-final. So this is um, Richard Irvin who runs that thing. Um, just illustrating the ferocity, my, my video only goes so far, it didn't stop, my video did. Uh, the ferocity and the intensity of fan engagement while they were watching TV. They weren't just sitting there only on social media, they were engaging with this event through you know, the big screen of the TV and the little screen of the, uh, of the, you know, the Twitter or the Facebook post. So multi-screening is a thing. The other reason you do it is because it gives you the opportunity to increase your frequency of contact. And if game day is only once a week, this gives you the opportunity to connect seven days a week. If you know, your, your world champs is only once every four years, this gives you the opportunity, if they want, to connect with you, your athletes, your club, your wider organisation, as often as they want. So that's a bit of a, a preach to the converted, since so many of you seem to be using social media anyway. This is my case for organisations to spend the time, spend the money, spend the effort, and take the risk, and we'll get to that in a minute, uh, to engage in social media. Okay. Should we have questions as we go, or should we have questions at the end? This feels like a lot. one of those, this is like um, half time chew the orange thing. <laughs> I should have brought oranges. That would have been, oh, oh, I really thought it through, I would have brought oranges. Has anyone got any questions that are sort of burning that they want to sort of pop in with now? Because I'd rather do it now than, you know, wait half an hour. Anybody? No? Okay, we're in, the, we're in the mode of asking questions at the end. So we've accepted that we want to do social media, maybe. Maybe we've accepted that. Who, who's, who's on, we've we got the Twitter hands, who's on Facebook? So quite a lot more. How about um, Trade Me Forums? That's a really big number. That's, if, you re if you wanna know um, what a large and interesting group of New Zealanders are up to, go to Trade Me, click on Community and click on Message Boards. It is a whole other world of social media. If you wanna know who the athlete with name suppression is, go to the Trade Me Message Boards. <laughs> a, that joke works every time because there always is one. Anyway, there's probably one in the room. I don't know. <laughs> so what's the recipe for social media success? Um, you're all familiar with the Mad Butcher. Well, this is a photo I took. I was outside a shop called the Totally Fucked Up Butcher. Um, this is my recipe for social media success. It applies to all sorts of businesses, all sorts of organizations, and it never fails. You've just got to have the appetite. Three ingredients for social media success. The first one's on the left. Can you see what it is from the back? Shout it out. Pardon me? A fish head. No, it's not a fish head. Oh, it's, a, it's, a bit of a, it's a bit of a blurry photo. Heart. Did someone say heart? Sure you did. That's heart. 
number one ingredient for social media success, I reckon, is heart. And for a sports coach, a sports team, or an athlete, that's kind of easy, because that's what you're all about, heart. And what I mean by that is knowing who you are and knowing what you're about. Why is that important? Because advertising has changed with the coming of the internet and the coming of social media. 50 years ago, advertising and making a brand connection with your audience was largely about finding a great big wall, getting a few pots of paint, and slapping your message up on that wall, uh, you know, in bright colors and big letters. And if you've been down to Britomart, there's a couple of those, those buildings inside them, the, the walls that used to be exterior walls that used to face the sea, you can still see bushels, you know, drink bushels, coffee, and that was enough. So 50 years ago, it was enough to find a wall and paint your message. You know, fund a million dollars, make a TV ad, job done. What social media does is puts windows in those walls. Okay, so everyone outside the organization can see in and they can connect directly, you know, with your, with your staff, with your athletes, with your coaches, with all those people. And there are two approaches to that. This was kind of scary when this sort of started happening, you know, started getting big five, six years ago. It was kind of scary. And the usual response was, holy hell, people can see inside our organization. There's, there's these windows that are appearing. What are we going to do? And the usual response was, well, we need a policy. Okay? We need rules. We need a policy that says, you know, only, uh, only you can sit next to that window because you've done the sitting next to the window course. And it sounds funny when you say it like this, but it's kind of true. And since there's only one of you and you've only one person's done the course, we're only going to open that window Monday to Friday, 9 to 6, uh, because, you know, we don't want the wrong people standing by the window. If there's a hard question, close the window, go upstairs to the third floor, uh, get an answer, you know, type it out, put it in the mimeograph, bring it back down and open the window and answer the question. And that is the usual approach still in a lot of large organizations, ooh, flowers, to, uh, to social media. Have a policy, control access, control who the voice is, and sometimes control the hours. You know, there are companies in, the, in this country that are meant to be, you know, you would expect to give um, round-the-clock service that have, you know, nine to six social media. It just doesn't work that way. So what's the better approach? Well, I reckon the better approach is to rely on people having heart. And what I mean by that is just be a good business, be a good club, be a good team, and work really hard to make sure that everyone in the organization knows why you're there, what your purpose is, who you are, what you're about, who your customers are, what's your reason for being. And if that just sounds like good business, it's because it is, okay? Like so many of these things, it's not about advertising, it's not about social media, it's just about having a good organizational culture. If you do that, everyone can sit next to a window. Everyone can have the window open, everyone outside can ask a question anytime they like, and anyone inside can give an answer. Which is kind of scary, but it works. Okay, so that's heart. Brains! Has anyone seen the new Thunderbirds thing? Is it any good? Everyone's saying that. They're saying it so-so. I'm scared to watch it now. I had such high hopes. Such high hopes. Brains. Um, brains are not actually that important. Um, found you. Every time uh, I look in the audience to see the person with that look in their face, and I've, I've found him. He's here. Uh, it's... <laughs> Hi. Hi. I won't say which side it's on, even. Um, it's okay, we're talking about brains, it's okay to be sitting here in a talk like this and go, oh, I don't really understand this stuff. This stuff's not for me. I don't use it. I don't really get it. It's okay to be sitting there like that, but it's not okay to be sitting there like that in three months' time. If you, if you think it's important, it's not okay to be sitting there in three months' time like that because it's not that complicated. It's not rocket science. It was invented by a guy in his bedroom to decide which chicks were hot and which chicks were not. You know, it's not top level stuff. Have you seen the Facebook movie? The actual room wasn't as nice as the one in the movie, was it? That's a pretty crappy room. So it's not that complicated. It doesn't take that long to learn. It's one of those things that you can learn by doing. You know, it's not like brain surgery where you go and practice a little bit of brain surgery. You can actually pick up the tools and use social media in your personal life 
and the skills that you pick up there translate absolutely directly to what you're going to do in the real world. There's a real acceptance that at a really senior level, a lot of people will say, okay, my organization is going to use social media and you know, I'm going to hire some people and we're going to put some budget into it and we're going to make it part of our, our comm strategy, yet a CEO or a CMO might not use it themselves. And that's kind of weird. It's a bit like saying we're going to spend $10 million on TV. I've heard of TV. I understand it's very good. Young people watch TV. The, the Thunderbird's not very good. The rest of it, quite good. I myself do not have a TV. Never seen TV, but we're going to spend $10 million on TV. If you're going to use social media as an organization, use it yourself personally. And that's the quickest way you'll, you know, you'll go from, um, from that to, uh, I was just trying to find a contrasting face, not yours. Uh, <laughs> That! I caught you in a bad moment, didn't I? <laughs> you were thinking of that tropical island. You really were. Okay, the third ingredient is my favorite, which is why it's in the middle in my crazy butcher's window. Oh, close to guts, quite close to my guts. Down a bit. <laughs> Balls! Bollock, we should say it as a bit of a team building thing. One, two, three. Balls! Say it to the camera. <laughs> That'll be quite something. Um, bollocks. I, I struggled to find a gender neutral um, illustration of this. Um, someone suggested spine, but spine, you know, a, a spine held up is not a beautiful thing. But these are quite beautiful, I think. And that's quite a good price. <laughs> <laughs> so the third ingredient in our social media recipe for success is bollocks. A nice big dangly pair of bollocks. And what I mean by that is the courage to, it sounds like um, Alcoholics Anonymous, um, the courage to accept that stuff's going to go wrong, you can't prevent it. You can't prevent stuff going wrong. Impossible. Accept that stuff will go wrong, but beyond that, accept that the way you respond to that will actually define you as an organization, as an athlete, as a team, far more than the stuff you plan. Way more. Example. The th next two examples both happened at 4 o'clock on a Friday afternoon, which is a lesson to anyone running a social media team, just by the way. You know the clink, clink, clink of the drinks trolley? That's the soundtrack to the next two examples. Um, Vodafone UK made this tweet. Um, I'll give you some context. <laughs> so the context is, the guy running the social media account, well, what he'd done, you, you would have guessed this, he tweeted to the work account when he thought he was tweeting to the personal account. And I've done that. The Prime Minister did that to me one day. That was really funny. Um, well, his social media person did. Um, has anyone done that before? You will do it in the future. It's, a, it's just going to happen. So the person who, you know, he, he was on the wrong account. The context is he was a gay guy. He just had a bad relationship experience. He was making an ironic comment to his friends. Turns out he wasn't. He was making a comment to all of Vodafone UK's customers. Um, that, that's the actual tweet. It's a bit harder to read, but that just shows you that it's real. Um, interestingly, there are a bunch of complaints. I'll go back a slide. And more than half the complaints, this is England. Any, any English people here? I'll pick on you three people. Um, more than half the complaints focused on one specific part of this tweet. The apostrophe! The apostrophe. <laughs> Absolutely. There is no apostrophe in homos. And people were outraged. People were outraged that <laughs> the Vodafone UK guy would, uh, would think there was. Honestly, anything else? I will not brook bad punctuation in your homophobic tweets. Um, <laughs> this is what happened to their follower numbers. Can you see where the, the bad thing happened? So the bad thing wasn't really a bad thing. When people reveal themselves to be human, invariably it leads to good stuff. Where Raylene fronts the blog, rather than just saying this is the official blog of the, the Canterbury Bankstown Bulldogs, where she puts her face on the blog and fronts the blog, good things happen. Closer to home, four o'clock on a Friday, across the ditch. This was one of those um, weeks when the bank, Westpac in this case, uh, announced a, an enormous profit. And this was around the time that um, Ralph Norris was being burnt in effigy on the streets of Sydney. Not a good time for banks. So exactly the same thing happened. 
drinks trolley, tweet, wrong account, bugger. The guy's name is Carlos, I'll, I'll skip to the end. He's, he's, he went on to be employed by Westpac for many years, did really well and now has an even better job. So three things happened in response to this. Oh, so very over it today. Three things happened. Maybe you can go dive in a swimming pool full of my money to make you feel better. <laughs> and so on, and so on, and so on. Uh, there's, nothing, there's nothing more flattering and funny for an Australian person than to hear their accent parodied. I always find Mr. New South Wales, wherever you are. Um, yeah, I'd, I'd be over it too if I only made a billion. So that was the first wave. But that was replaced, really interestingly, by a second wave. And the second wave looked a bit like this. <laughs> so people actually like that worst perk screwed up. They liked that there was this one person who was human and fallible and, and something went wrong and they screwed up. And it made, you know, Westback feel like me. You know, we all make mistakes. And they picked up 200 followers over the course of the day. And then there was a third wave. And if you're cynical, you can guess what the third wave was. Anyone? Yeah. The Sydney Morning Herald thought that it was social media marketing genius. Uh, they thought they'd planned it all along in order to appear human. I've worked with banks. Uh, I don't believe that they, uh, they planned it all along. <laughs> they planned some things, but they didn't, they didn't, they didn't plan that. But uh, it's making those mistakes. It's being human. It's, it's screwing up in this space. I wouldn't go out and deliberately do it, but it's when you do that that it uh, allows you to show your true colors. So there's the recipe, heart, brains, and bollocks. So let's say you've taken this recipe on board and I'm just going to check the time because I can't see a timer. Oh yeah, not bad. You've taken this recipe on board. You've decided you want to do it. How do you do it day by day? Just a few pointers. Um, every little thing you put out, ask yourself, is it useful? Is it interesting? Yes, sir. Quick question. Um, you said that um, it's the way that you respond to people that matters. So how does Vodafone and Westpac respond? In that case, the, yeah, good point. They, um, they apologized and moved on and kept the people. Yeah. Um, they, could have, they could have fired the people, I guess. Uh, they could have disciplined them, but they, they openly, you know, they, they explained what had happened. So I should have had that slide too. They explained what had happened, and people went, cool, that happens. People are humans. Yeah. Um, is anyone else from Wellington? Oh, lots of people. Um, do you remember LV Martin? appliances from when you were a kid, and he used to say it's the putting right that counts. You know, shit happens, but it's the putting right that counts. Uh, if you are doing this stuff, be useful, be interesting. If you're going to tweet, you're going to post, you're going to put up a picture, is it useful, is it interesting, is it both? If it's none of those, well, don't do it. And by interesting, I don't mean it's got to be about you, and I'll get to that. Um, I got this one from um, Trade Me. This is from their, from their corporate values, and I actually, I, th I thought I'd illustrate this with a you know, picture. So I, 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 didn't, I wanted a big one, a really big one. So I searched for that. There he is. Um, just, uh, just don't be a dick. Right, move on. And don't, uh, don't take pictures of it either. Although that, that's, that's kind of generational. It, it's interesting. It's generational. I think in 10, in ten years, um, we won't be criticizing the athlete that takes a picture of his dick. We'll be criticizing the people that shared it. You know, because... Don't ask me how I know this, but um, the younger you get, the more acceptable a way of having a relationship that is. So it'll be an interesting shift. Uh, oh, there we go. Which leads me to this. Um, except this is a Venn diagram that doesn't actually overlap. There's stuff you do online, and then there's privacy. Except that anything that you, your athletes, your coaches, your administrators put online anywhere is out there. And even that... You know, by online, I mean on your private networks and things as well. As the Game of Thrones people found out yesterday, right? When was it four episodes got leaked before they even uh, went to air? Um, a couple of comments on the sort of stuff I think is good to talk about online. Is anyone from Ponsonby like me? Of course not. No sports in Ponsonby. Um, there's a bar at the end of my street, and it's a bit of a strange bar because uh, I think it's the first Tuesday of every month, they allow animals to go to the bar instead of people. Uh, they're just trying something, it's Ponsonby. <laughs> and I snuck in there 
because um, I was curious. I mean, hey, what is this bar that? What do they, they even drink? Um, so I got my little, I got my cat costume on, and I snuck in, and I was surreptitiously photographing these two from across the bar. The, um, the cat on the left is, is a lady cat. Um, the cat on the right is a man cat. <laughs> and I got close enough to hear what they were talking about. Um, and she was just, oh, she just wanted to be anywhere else. She wanted to be on that tropical, she wanted to be a million miles from Gareth Morgan. Um, <laughs> maybe that's why, maybe this whole bar was just a trap. <laughs> I didn't stick around. But she just wanted to die. He wouldn't stop talking. What do you think he was talking about? Himself. The women in the room usually shout that out, and the men go, I don't know what he's talking about. <laughs> Himself. And this is kind of the picking, picking chicks up in bars um, guide to social media, or picking boys up in bars guide to social media, depending on your preference. Um, if you spend the whole time talking about yourself, the cat on the left will be the result. Uh, I like to look at it as a sort of a, you know, Mercedes logo, um, and balance communications out like this. Most of us tend to speak about us, ourselves, Hey, we're the, uh, you know, we're the Vodafone Warriors, so all you want to hear about is the Vodafone Warriors, or whoever. Uh, better, I think, to take the bar approach. So enough about me. What are you doing at the weekend? You know? What are you into? Oh, I see you've got shoes on. You must have feet. I also have feet. <laughs> I'm not going to use that one ever again. Uh, but then there's, then there's the third party. There's other, you know, hey, what about Thunderbirds? Do you see that Thunderbirds thing on TV? So us, you, and them. And when you balance those things out, you get a bit more of a natural conversation. This is actually really hard to do as a brand because you think, you know, we must talk about our brand because that's why people are here, but actually it's not what people necessarily want to hear. You know, and, and the us stuff, you can mix that up too. It doesn't just have to be, you know, here's our training stats and videos and things for the weekend. It can be, hey, you know, it was the coach's birthday, so we baked him this awesome cake. And that's totally appropriate. Absolutely. People want to people see inside your organization. They want to see through those windows. Tell the truth, obviously, because the social uh, media will find you out super, super, super fast. I went to a PR launch um, a little while ago for a, for a tablet, you know, for a, um, not, not for a blue tablet that relates to something I spoke about earlier, uh, but for a glass internet thing. And I said to the PR person there, I said, isn't, isn't this the tablet that Apple was suing and they can't sell in lots of countries. She said, no, 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 it's a, have a glass of wine. And sort of between there and sitting down at my table, I, I sort of tweeted about that. And a guy in Germany came back, you know, within 30 seconds, says, yeah, that's a tablet. It's illegal. Take a photo. <laughs> you can't. You <laughs> so if there's any German people, I've offended you too. Um, that, that was roughly based on the pigs in, in the Shrek movies. They're my, they're my favorite German people. Um, you can't get away with telling fibs. You know, time was that you had until the newspaper came out, you know, tomorrow to, you know, retract, correct, talk to the editor, have a quick phone call, but this all happens in real time now, so you don't have time for that. Uh, if you're going to do it, do it. I'm working with a, a large organization at the moment, um, having a look at their social media, and I asked them what they were doing with certain accounts, and they said, well, you know, we didn't know what they were for, so we shut them down. And that was the most awesome thing I've ever heard in my work. Absolutely awesome. If you don't know what they're there for, if you're not using them, shut them down. But if you do have them, use them. There's, uh, there's no point in tweeting like a dead canary. It's like opening a shop in a mall, you know, buying some expensive mall space, you know, like Doggy's Cafe. Opening the shop, great opening day, and then going away for a week. In the meantime, your customers are going, well, wasn't there, there was a cafe, the, the, where are they gone? If you're going to do it, do it. And accept that it actually takes commitment. Okay, so you're going to need to be there. You know, when the Twitter phone rings, you got to answer that thing. Hey, so that's my talky-talky part. We'll get on to the questiony-questiony part. If you want to hear some more of this kind of stuff, I do a thing on Sunday nights on Radio Live, uh, 7 o'clock, and it's this kind of stuff. Uh, and I also have this, which is about four years out of date, but it's free, so it kind of works out. Uh, if you Google tweet this book, you can download and, you know, read a bit more about what I think about social media. Who has a question? I'm so thirsty. Oh, I think there's a microphone coming, mainly for, mainly for the benefit of the camera. Hi, hi uh, Vaughan. Um, my, you said you can make mistakes, and I get that. 
My question to you is, is there, because we probably in this room have all experienced mistakes that are irrecoverable. So how do you recover from a really, really big cock up? Because that's the, you know, career ending type things happen to sports stars when they make that. So what's your advice to someone that makes that sort of um, mistake? How do you try and recover from it? I think the, the two principles, um, firstly, is to fight social media fire with social media water. And by that I mean you can't um, respond to a scandal that's happening in social media by issuing a press release over here. The two worlds don't necessarily collide. Uh, and the second thing I think would, uh, would be speed, to be honest. I mean, some, I'm, I'm not a PR person. So your, your PR and you know, corporate reputation people will probably advise differently, or they may advise the same, and they may say, hey, it'll all just blow over, go away. But I think quick engagement is, uh, is good engagement. But the third thing, which you can't really do at the time, but you've got, kind of got to do 24-7 ahead of time, is to trust your community and trust the crowd. Um, I have a, a slide which I'll describe. This is the, this is the coolest piece of AV ever. But uh, ASB, um, the bank here in New Zealand if you're a visitor, had a, a troll, a person come and say, um, hey ASB, I'm gonna um, switch banks soon, which bank, sh or why should I switch to you? Go. I hate people who end their tweets with go. It's really rude. But anyway, they picked it up. And right, they could have done two things. Well, three things. They could have ignored it, which would have been bad. They could have answered it, or they could have trusted their own community. And in this case, they trusted their own community. What they did is remove the guy's name, so they're not, you know, we're not pointing a finger at him. They put it on their page and said, well, we just got this question, what do you guys think? And they got like 190 pos positive answers, 10 negative ones in, in half an hour. So through building up that community, building up that crowd, and then having the opportunity to trust them, I think it's a good way of dealing with those things. Got a roundabout answer for you. Yeah. Uh, Vaughan, um, how do you know when you've got it right? Is it just that your, your fan base or your community is growing, or are there other indicators that you're doing it right? Well, I mean, growing's certainly good. I mean, there's, there's, there's a, a real um, criticism of social media that, you know, the numbers aren't everything. You know, the number of, the number of tweets aren't everything, the number of, oh, sorry, the number of Twitter followers aren't everything, the number of Facebook fans aren't everything. But they do count. I mean, you know, it's, it's, like, it's like a stadium, right? You know, you, you could apply that to a stadium and say, yeah, we've only got 10 people come to ANZ this weekend, but my God, they're quality fans. You know, that doesn't wash. So numbers, numbers do count. But it all comes back to, your, you know, your basic business metrics. I mean, I, I don't sell social media for its own end. I'm talking about it today, but, you know, my other work, we do all sorts of other advertising and stuff. And, you know, if it, if it drives your, uh, you know, drives your ticket sales, if it drives your net promoter score, if it drives all those other things that matter to your business, then it's, then it's working. Harder to actually, you know, slice out what's driving what, but, um, you know, social media scores in themselves aren't, aren't, the, aren't the end. It's business metrics. Yes? Yeah, I'm from a, a volunteer sort of sports, oh, sorry. A great presentation. From a volunteer sort of sports perspective, um, Facebook in particular was a, a popular medium because it was free and it's obviously moved to this commercial sure medium. Has. Do you see these other platforms sort of moving in that space as well? And I suppose the challenges associated for local clubs to sort of reach out and connect with their markets and new markets as well. Yeah, well, I mean, what would you do if you were Facebook or you were Twitter or you were Instagram, right? They're, they're all moving towards making a buck. So there's a, um, I'll, I'll describe a graph to you, which is the most exciting thing I'm going to do today. Uh, imagine a graph. I can do it. I can do it with my laser and burn it into your eyes or something. Uh, yeah, that works. Can we see that laser? Yep. Not really. Imagine a graph with Facebook share price going like that over time. Can we picture that? It's a bar graph. <laughs> Is this working? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> and then on the same graph, we're going to plot what we call organic reach of Facebook posts. And that's where if you do a Facebook post, what percentage of people in your fan base will see it? Oh, wrong button. Oh, nice picture. Um, like that. And one follows the other. So the more commercially focused Facebook comes, the more it, uh, you know, the more it wants you to buy reach. You cannot rely, if you're, if you're on Facebook, um, you have to pay to promote your posts. You just do. But the answer to that is to find ways to connect directly with your fans. So it, for me, this is becoming the golden age of email. Email's coming back. You, know, you own your email database. The more you can do to drive customers to your own assets, because Mark Zuckerberg could wake up tomorrow and say, fuck it, I'm not doing Facebook anymore, gone. 
He can do that. There's nothing stopping him. And if you built your whole fan base, your whole communication strategy on this thing that you don't own and you don't pay for, it's pretty risky. So I think driving your fans to your, you know, your own channels and your own assets is a really good idea. Link them to social media, but making social media, you know, making someone else's free platform the heart of your comm strategy is really risky, I think. Fellow over there. Should you follow everyone that follows you and shouldn't you be heartbroken if they don't follow you back? <laughs> heartbreak comes easily on social media. I've, I've had my heart broken three times on the way here. Just, oh. Um, <laughs> but we're not talking about Tinder today, are we? No. Um, well, it goes back to that slide of John Key with the big ear things on, right? If you're just, if you're just trying to use social media as a broadcast channel, then not following anyone back is, is appropriate for that use, but I don't support that use. If you're using it as a community engagement, community service and listening and research channel, then I, you know, personally, I follow anyone back that's not a robot. You know, I, and, and I find in my professional life, uh, just you know, looking at Twitter and looking at the unexpected, diverse and interesting stuff that comes through is really stimulating and I learn heaps. So yeah, I, there's no, you know, a follow costs nothing. And, and you know what, if I, were, um, if I were an All Blacks fan and the All Blacks followed me back, how would I feel? You know, if I was a Hamish Carter fan and Hamish Carter followed me back, just, just saying, uh, <laughs> how would I feel? You know, I'd, I'd feel really great. And it's cost, it's cost you nothing to do that follow back, you know? And it doesn't have to clutter up your social media, you know, your screens and things, there are ways around that. So yeah, I'd, I'd, if in doubt, follow back, personally. <laughs>